This lecture is part of a series of lectures for RAD229 MRI signals and sequences offered in the Department of Radiology at Stanford University. The fifth lecture, MRI Imperfections, Part 1, is broken down into three parts, and Lecture 5b covers eddy currents. The learning objectives for this lecture include being able to appreciate the origin of eddy currents in MRI, describe the impact of eddy currents on two common MRI sequences, mathematically explain how eddy currents impact gradient waveforms, and explain two or more methods to mitigate eddy current-induced MRI artifacts. I've used this slide previously to discuss some of the B-field assumptions we have in MRI, and here we focus on those associated with gradient fields. We assume they're perfectly linear over space, and that was a previous lecture that covered gradient linearity and nonlinearity. We also are concerned with gradient fields, or we assume that gradient fields are temporarily modulated exactly as specified, and we also uh, do not typically include Maxwell fields. This lecture will focus on whether or not we temporally modulate gradient fields exactly as specified as a consequence specifically of eddy currents. Gradients move us through k-space. We assume we move through k-space precisely as programmed. The recorded signals are assigned to locations in a k-space matrix based on this assumption. If this assumption is no good, then the recorded k-space is distorted relative to reality. Why is precise temporal modulation important? You can pause the video while you think about the answer. Is it that gradient waveforms directly control T1 and T2 contrast? That gradient timing impacts the total available bulk magnetization? that gradient waveforms encode image information, or that gradient timing is important for controlling image contrast. The most important reason is that gradient waveforms help us to encode image information. So let's talk about the origins of eddy currents. Here we have a teardown of an MRI hardware system that we've used previously, demonstrating just a few of the essential components. The gradient hardware shown in orange, yellow, and uh, sort of cyan green as well as uh, the great, those are the gradients, uh, hardware gradients. We have the body transmit uh, system, which is used for generating RF pulses and can be used as a receiver. And then we have the main coil windings in the so-called cryostat, a liquid helium doer that keeps the main coil at superconducting temperatures. In fact, the MR system is full of lots of uh, conducting structures, metallic structures that can support currents. And if currents are coursing through a metallic structure, you'll generate a magnetic field. And this is fundamentally the origin of eddy currents. The gradient coils, for example, uh, via Faraday's law of induction, generate magnetic fields, and those magnetic fields can impart uh, uh, fluxes in nearby conducting elements. This might be the cryostat, it might be an element of the body coil, it might be some hardware support structure inside the MR system. We can model these individual hardware components somewhere inside the MR system as LR circuits that get charged through Faraday's law of induction anytime we're activating the gradient coil, anytime we're generating a time rate of change of magnetic field flux. If we do so, then any of these individual elements will be charged to have a current, and when the gradient is no longer uh, changing with time, no longer slewing, that current would decay according to some resistance and inductance values associated with the individual hardware component. Or perhaps a series of these is just simply used to model the composite behavior of many uh, underlying hardware structures. Uh, put more simply, the eddy currents that are charged up inside any of these systems will decay with time uh, according to some leading coefficient that, that scales the amount of current generated and they will decay with some time constant. And the time constants can have a very wide range in MR systems from microseconds to milliseconds, even hundreds of milliseconds. Now, according to the Biot-Savar law, any currents that we're generating, those currents are in turn running through conducting structures inside the MR system, and those currents will in turn generate fields. And so the eddy currents themselves actually generate eddy B fields. And it's these B fields that superpose with the, with the designed fields, say the gradient fields and the B0 field, and lead to uh, uh, problems with our imaging system. So let's think about a specific example. 
what kinds of problems can eddy currents really cause? Well, diffusion encoding gradients are used to sensitize image spin to the self-diffusion of water molecules. And typically they take the form of a large gradient waveform applied before and after a refocusing pulse, uh, which is followed with say an EPI readout. These large gradients here sensitize us to diffusion. The refocusing pulse helps us offset the effects of off resonance and the EPI readout is a very quick way to acquire image information. So these large diffusion encoding gradients will, however, induce eddy currents. And the eddy currents produce B fields, and those B fields persist during readout. So imagine having a large gradient here that you turn off, you've charged up some nearby conducting structure, and its eddy currents are dissipating during the process of EPI readout. The eddy current B fields uh, are diffusion gradient direction dependent. So in diffusion imaging, we typically play these gradients on any combination of the, of the X, Y, and Z axes. So we're playing gradients in different directions, and each of those applied gradients will in fact have a different uh, eddy current response. And this results in image distortions and in image misregistration. Uh, when we're acquiring diffusion images along different gradient directions, we ultimately want to composite that information into some model of the underlying diffusive process. But if the images are misregistered, we can't do so correctly or properly. So, so here's a, a graphical example of what's actually happening. On the right-hand side here, I'm demonstrating different gradient directions that might be used during a diffusion encoding experiment. On the left-hand side is the images that accord with each of those underlying diffusion encoding directions. And you can see that there's a significant amount of distortion and misregistration between these images, which would lead to uh, challenges or difficulties when trying to combine these uh, independent images uh, to understand the underlying diffusive process. Now, the eddy currents don't just affect things like image distortion and, and maybe uh, image uh, uh, magnitudes, but it can also uh, affect the phase of the magnetic resonance imaging signal. Eddy currents can also impact the small encoding gradients that we use to sensitize uh, the imaging system to spin velocity. This technique is called phase contrast magnetic resonance imaging. The idea is that in two, between two different TRs, we can change the so-called first moment of the gradient waveforms and give a sensitivity to the velocity of moving spins. In the first TR, we flow compensate the slice select gradient, that is we have a zero first moment and we measure the phase. And in the second echo, uh, we have a flow encoded uh, uh, slice select gradient waveform, which sensitizes us directly to the velocity of the moving spins. And the difference of these uh, two uh, signals can be used to directly estimate the velocity uh, by subtracting out uh, off resonance uh, phases. And so the result is that we have a velocity that's directly proportional to phase. Now, these small velocity encoding gradients can still induce eddy currents, and eddy currents that can cause uh, um, small deviances or deviations, rather, in the, in the signal phase. And these eddy currents produce B fields, and those B fields, of course, are spatially distributed and can cause an offset to the underlying signal phase. And this eddy current phase does not subtract in phase difference processing or the phase contrast processing used in this kind of imaging. In fact, the eddy currents add together. And this results in phase errors and velocity offsets as well. So here we can see a magnitude image acquired with phase contrast. And this is uh, just showing the overall anatomy of the images. Uh, in fact, this is a, a balanced SSFP magnitude image that we just use for reference. Uh, so here is the aortic valve, the liver, and the lung. And the idea is we could use this phase contrast technique on the left to measure, for example, velocities as the, of the moving blood as it's coming through the aorta. Now when we do so, when we look at the phase image, we may get something like this. We say high positive phases, that's velocities moving, say, towards the head at maybe 100 centimeters per second. Uh, and in the descending aorta, that we see flow going in the opposite direction, maybe minus 100 centimeters per second. And this is a nice technique for measuring blood velocities, but the downside is you can see in stationary tissues like the chest wall, we have non-zero velocities. So there's a problem with uh, velocity accuracy and precision associated with eddy current fields that impart residual phase or eddy current phase onto the signal of interest. 
So in the absence of eddy currents, what should the phase be in static tissues? Should it be pi or minus pi? Should it be zero? It depends on the TE or it depends on the TR. You can pause the slide while you think about this. Pause the video. And the answer is zero, right? If it's truly static tissue, we expect a zero velocity condition. But as I showed in the previous slide, those background tissues can be substantially non-zero. And this is uh, directly seen in static tissues like the chest wall and the back, but it infers that there's a non-zero background velocity in areas of interest as well. And this requires correction if we're going to make accurate velocity uh, estimates, which can be useful clinically uh, for understanding blood flow. So let's think more mathematically about eddy currents and where eddy currents arise from. I mentioned it previously, but the eddy current, say, uh, from uh, the x gradient arises from the derivative, the time derivative of the x gradient, that is the slew rate. This gives us a time rate of change of magnetic field flux, and it's convolved with some undercurrent, under, uh, underlying uh, exponential function. And we don't necessarily know this weighting factor, some, some beta factor. We'd have to measure this for a particular MR system. And this uh, eddy current itself will decay as a function of time according to some time constant tau. Now this is just the eddy current induced by the x gradient. We'd have different eddy currents induced by y gradients and z gradients, for example. And so we notice here that eddy currents are only generated while slewing. And the amplitude of the current depends on a system-specific coefficient and a system-specific time constant. And in fact, the MR system may be characterized by many time constants, and so we more typically model this as a sum of multiple exponentials. And these exponentials may map to a specific hardware component, but more generally, they're just used to model the composite system. Uh, and that is, we use several time constants uh, to, to model the system rather than having specific time constants associated with individual hardware elements inside the scanner. Now, the eddy currents themselves generate B fields. You remember through uh, Bio Savar law that a current running through a conducting structure will lead to the generation of a B field. Now, interestingly, these currents can generate B fields, that is, uh, the magnitude and direction of the magnetic field can vary uh, over space, uh, and in this case will certainly be a function of time as these eddy currents decay. The first term we can define is what we call the B0 eddy current response function, and it's not a function of space, it's only a function of time. So it only affects sort of the global or total sort of background B0, and of course it dissipates as a function of time. It's still dependent on the time rate of change of the gradient waveform, the slew rate, which is convolved with a series of exponential functions. And here, the coefficient's been updated to represent a scaling between the current fields. And we introduced the heavy side step function just as a way of being mathematically precise. So what does this represent again? This is the so-called B0 eddy current, or zero order term, that's time but not space dependent. There's a unique response for each gradient axis, that is for the x, y, and z axes. And the system uh, specific eddy current response function is shown through the sum of exponentials. And interestingly, uh, the fields that we really care about are those that point along the z axis. We in fact can assume that the other directions are quite small and don't contribute significantly to spin phase or frequency. So let's think a little bit more carefully about this eddy current impulse response function because we'll simplify it and call it E of t. It depends on the heavy side step function mathematically. That is, it has a positive value for times greater than zero and is essentially undefined for negative times. And it's just a sum of weighted exponentials. The eddy current impulse response function is also unique for each gradient axis. So in principle, we could write this as a vector or subscript this for the specific gradient being activated. The amplitude of these eddy current response function coefficients is different for each time constant, each tau, uh, and it's also different for each scanner. So here I'm just nominally suggesting uh, that you could have two different uh, uh, sets of amplitudes for a range of different time constants for scanner one and for scanner two. And what this means is that you have to be able to characterize the eddy current impulse response function for a specific scanner. 
And in fact, this eddy current impulse response function can change for a particular scanner as a consequence of uh, shifting of hardware components or upgrades to systems and things like that. So if we look at the, uh, the eddy current field again, it can com be comprised of uh, two or more terms. Here we have the zero order eddy current term, not a function of space, but of time pointing just along k. And then we have the what we call the linear uh, eddy current response term. So this linear eddy current response term uh, does depend on a function of space. That means the eddy current field is, not, uh, is, is varying across space. Uh, but again, we're only concerned with fields pointing along the z-direction. Although other fields might be generated, they're generally small and don't contribute to spin phase or frequency in a significant way. So the total or the composite field now for an imaging experiment would consist of B0. It would consist of the applied gradient field uh, or applied gradients that when dotted with position would produce a field. And in addition to that, we have, in this example here, just the B0 eddy current terms. Uh, we're, we're leaving out the linear eddy current terms for simplicity. But this would be the composite fields that were active uh, during, say, an imaging experiment. And what you should notice here is that this term, the zero order eddy current term here, adds a component to the B field that contributes to encoding, depending on what we're trying to do at a particular point in a pulse sequence, but it also decays. So it simply superposes with the other fields and thereby causes you know, artifacts associated with our gradients not um, uh, performing exactly as we programmed them to in our pulse sequence. So here we can look at a simple example. I'll, I'll talk through the code uh, kind of quickly and you can pause it to look at it more carefully. We just define some simple things like time steps and gradient performance, maximum slew rates and, and gradient maximums. We can define a gradient waveform here. So here we're just defining a trapezoidal waveform that rises, has a flat top, and then falls, and a, and a time vector to go with it. And then we simply calculate the slew rate function by taking the, 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 uh, the difference, the, the discrete difference of the gradient waveform. So that gives us a trapezoidal gradient. We can define the eddy current response function. So we define a time constant, we give it a leading coefficient, and we assume it's uh, mono exponential just for simplicity. And if we want to estimate the, uh, the eddy current zero order field, we can just convolve our slew rate function uh, minus uh, the negative of our slew rate function with our eddy current impulse response function. And then we can plot out the results uh, that define some eddy current field as a consequence of the applied uh, gradient. And so uh, what we start off with uh, as a function of the code shown on the left is a gradient waveform shown here in red, just a trapezoidal gradient waveform. It's time derivative, has a positive slew rate early in the gradient waveform, and then it's relatively quiet. And then we have a negative slew rate at the end of the gradient waveform. And we're gonna convolve that with the eddy current response function. Uh, that starts off at 0.3 when time is zero and the decays as a function of time according to the time constant and leading coefficient we defined in the code on the left. When we do uh, uh, carry out the convolution and plot uh, the gradient field, the B0 eddy current field, and the composite gradient, we get the following. So shown in red is the gradient field uh, that we uh, intended to generate. Uh, the B0 eddy current is shown here in green, so that's the, that's the eddy current uh, zero order uh, gradient uh, alone uh, that, that would be generated. And then we can add that to the gradient field response to show uh, that while our intention was to reach a peak gradient at this particular point in time, the eddy current response has caused us to kind of under, undershoot the gradient waveform. Uh, and slowly approximate it as that eddy current dissipates. And then when we're slewing the other direction, we also uh, sort of undershoot uh, getting back down to gradient zero. And so here you can, you can, you can see, uh, for example, that that gradient was persisting uh, longer than it was originally intended to. And this gradient waveform here may be overlapping with another important gradient event like uh, slice select uh, uh, rephasing uh, or read out uh, pre-phasing or read out itself or any number of different gradient activities. Okay, so in summary, the basic assumption of MR is that the magnetic field gradients are applied exactly as programmed. 
but eddy current B fields can cause different problems. They can cause image distortions in DWI. They can cause phase errors, for example, in phase contrast MRI. And eddy currents can be measured uh, and they can be modeled. We can measure and model the eddy current impulse response function and then used for image magnitude and phase correction. We didn't get into the details of how you might go about doing that, but I'll point you to some references. So in terms of eddy current mitigation uh, techniques, uh, one approach or a first approach is simply image processing. I showed you image distortions previously, and there's ways that you could just uh, undistort those images, either based on uh, the physics of your imaging system or based on simple, more simple image processing approaches. You can also redefine how you make your MR hardware using so-called shielded gradient coils. Now, shielded gradient coils are common to all uh, modern MR systems, but of course, there's still uh, technologies being designed uh, to further uh, dampen eddy currents, for example. And shielded gradient coils are just additional uh, coil elements that uh, effectively absorb or offset the eddy current fields uh, uh, when the principal gradient fields are being applied. You can also perform system characterization. If you can measure specifically your eddy current impulse response over a wide range of time constants, you could know that and then deconvolve it from any of your uh, acquired imaging information. You can also think in terms of pulse sequence design. Uh, I'm here pointing to a specific project wherein we designed diffusion encoding gradient waveforms uh, that had self-canceling properties so that eddy currents didn't persist during the, the readout phase of the imaging experiment. And you can also do so-called pre-emphasis. So if you know something about the eddy current impulse response of your system, you could pre-emphasize, that is the gradient shown in red, uh, in the presence of, an, of a known eddy current impulse response will get you closer to your target gradient waveforms, those shown in blue. And that's a clever approach that's used on a lot of commercial systems as well. So that's an overview of how eddy currents in, impact our overall imaging experiment. Uh, what other field imperfections cause MR artifacts? Well, one of the ones that we'll talk about next are Maxwell fields or concomitant fields. So thanks for joining us again. You can click the links below and watch some of the additional videos uh, associated with this course.